Rich, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Yeah, thanks a lot, Andy. It's a real pleasure to be here and appreciate you taking the time to, to chat with me today. Just to kick us off, um, many people will have heard you, especially the clinicians in the audience, but would you be able to outline your background, sort of, I guess, career origins and bring us through to what you're doing today? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do that. So uh, I don't know, it's, I would say I have a little bit of a nonlinear route to where I am today, and I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing. But um, So I, I graduated from physical therapy school. I got my my master's of physical therapy in, at Ohio University in 1999. And then I worked as a full-time clinician for eight years. And uh, I actually started off in occupational health. So I started working off and working in factories and it's like steel plants and meatpacking plants. And it, it, it was a little bit unique, but the reason why I did that was because for anyone who was practicing at the time, they know that the job market wasn't really all that good for physical therapists. And of course I came out wanting to do you know, sports, physical therapy, and there just weren't a lot of those jobs. And so I took that job. But doing that work from an occupational health standpoint, which is pretty, which is a really, really great job. I got to, one of the things I learned very quickly was the model that I was taught in physical therapy school, which was someone's injured, you need to really deload them you know, completely and then allow them to recover. And that just doesn't work in the occupational health setting. And um, instead, it's like, we've got this injury, they have to stay on the job and, and, and keep working. And I, I think that translates really well to, uh, to sports now, professional sports um, in particular, where the goal is not to, not to pull an athlete out of participation or play, but make sure we, we keep doing some progressive loading with that person and kind of work around their injury from a, from a playing standpoint. So, so that, that, uh, that part's been really helpful. I, I did that for a couple of years, and then, of course, I, I moved into a lot more sports-specific type work. And I uh, worked at a you know, high-volume um, outpatient orthopedic and sports physical therapy practice in, in Colorado. And then went back for my PhD. is something I had always wanted to do, but it, I went to the University of Delaware and got my PhD. finished that in 2011. I studied with Irene Davis, and I studied running-related injuries. I was uh, funded under a couple grants, but one of them was from the DOD, from the Department of Defense, looking at, at bone stress injuries. So I did some work on that. But my, my dissertation focus was on patellofemoral pain, and I was looking at sex differences with that injury. So I spent a lot of time thinking a lot about patellofemoral pain, um, continued to do some work in that area. But um, since then, I've uh, been, you know, I still, still treat quite a bit, and I think that's maybe a little bit unique for for most researchers, so I still treat at least one day a week. Uh, I do some consulting outside too from both professional sports as well as NCAA sports. And um, I've kind of transitioned a little bit away from patellofemoral pain to more and more now I'm kind of dedicating most of my time and energy to working with athletes who have a bone stress injury or working on preventing a bone stress injury. So I live in Missoula, Montana in the United States and um, I've been here, this is my seventh year it's been, it's been a really good move to come here for a lot of reasons, but a big reason is, is that Missoula is kind of this big, this big running mecca, if you will, and so um, we have surrounded by, you know, really awesome running terrain as far as trails and so forth. So it's a, it's a big center for, for ultra running, and so um, with ultra running comes a lot of injuries, and in particular bone stress injuries. So living here has enabled me to kind of gain a lot of skills working with various bone stress injuries. Um, I, I do funded work for the Department of Defense, looking at bone stress injuries, how we can treat them better, how we can prevent them, um, how we can monitor loads in the field where from a wearable device standpoint. Um, starting to do some stuff looking at bone biomarkers um, as well. But as I mentioned, I, I still treat quite a bit. So I work with a lot of professional athletes, both professional runners as well as professional basketball players and you know, across a couple other different sports as well. And, I think that that's the thing that really kind of motivates me the most. I think that um, it really informs the research that I do. And so I, I, think, I think when I, I first came out with my PhD, I was kind of considering myself to be a clinical biomechanist, if you will. So I kind of looked at clinical problems from a biomechanical standpoint. And I kind of really thought that that had the, you know, was the root of most pathologies. But I think... I moved quickly away from that, realizing that once you get out of the academic setting, it doesn't necessarily translate super well. And so I've, I really kind of identify myself as a clinician first and foremost. And see biomechanics is just one of the tools that can kind of help us answer some questions and provide insight into why the athlete has that injury and how we can 
you know, hopefully put together the best path forward for them to recover from their injury. Yeah. And if we kind of, um, what, what I think might work really well today, if we're talking about bone stress injury specifically, is if we maybe flow through the conversation in what I think might be a logical narrative for clinicians. So would you be able to maybe set the scene and talk us through what contributes to overall bony loads or bone stress loads? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I would say that this is an area that is probably the, you know, how we're, how we're viewing bone loads has evolved the most. I think of really any injury um, or any anatomical region when it comes to um, like sporting biomechanics, whether it be running or jumping or what have you. And so we, we used to really think that the big contributor to bone forces were impact forces. Um, so essentially like how, how much your, how, like, or the rate of collision with your, of your body with the ground. So that, that impact was really thought to really contribute a lot. But now that we're starting to have more sophisticated musculoskeletal modeling techniques, we're really starting to understand that it, it's really the muscle forces that are contributing the most. So when you look at, when you look at when someone's running, we, we can, we, we have, I think the easiest one to look at is our, is our tibia, and that makes a lot of sense because that's the most commonly injured or most common bone stress injury, or side of bone stress injuries in both runners as well as basketball players. But when we, when we run, our, our plantar flexors are, are, are obviously contracting quite a bit. They're the, the, the main contributor to both vertical support as well as propulsion or um, propulsive forces. And um, our plantar flexor forces are usually around, you know, six to seven body weights of, of total force when we're running. And then when we look at the tibia, uh, our tibial bone forces end up being around, around 10 to 12 body weights of compressive forces when we're running. So that's a tremendous amount. And so what you do is for usually when we're, when we're thinking about ground reaction forces, our impact forces, those are around two to two and a half uh, body weights of force. So if you can add those two together, the plantar flexor forces plus our ground reaction forces, you can see that our muscle forces represent about 80% of the total force that is being applied to a bone. And so when we, when we start thinking about kind of, re, I guess, reframe what, like our view of what is contributing to, to bone forces, and shift away from impact forces to more to muscle forces that can really inform how we're evaluating workload and runners and basketball players and soccer players, uh, and can also really inform how we're designing rehabilitation programs uh, as well. Cool. And um, obviously, you work with different sports teams where, the, and a lot of our listenership is kind of people that are in sports teams as well, where maybe budgets and access to tools is a little bit greater than in stereotypical private practice. What's the sort of current best practice or, you know, top of the range, top line um, mm. way for us to detect bone stress injuries if we've got everything at our disposal? Yeah, boy, that's a great question. And I think, I, I, I think that this is, this is a question that, that gets sent to me quite a bit. Like, what's a sensor that we can get for our team or that we should consider getting for our team that can help either monitor bone forces when someone's running and jumping and cutting um, or one that we can use that can help guide rehabilitation afterward and after some sort of bone stress injury. And so um, I would say that the, the most common one that you're going to see is some sort of accelerometer that's going to be attached to the limb. So, you know, if, you, if you're watching the video of this, I've got this, like this, this, this IMU or, I'm a, or this inertial measurement unit um, here, and there are various different models of that. So some insole ones like Plantiga makes one, uh, some other couple companies out there too. But what those are measuring is those are measuring like limb acceleration. In other words, that it's really focused on that, um, that impact force. And so, uh, so we've got those, we've got those type of sensors and more and more what we're starting to do is we're starting to transition more to like to pressure insoles. Um, with pressure insoles, we get a really good guess on, on total uh, bone forces from that using some different um, algorithms because we can estimate plantar flexor forces with them as well. And again, if we know plantar flexor forces, then we have a pretty good idea about bone forces in our lower limb. And so when we look at these accelerometers, uh, they've been around for a while and they're very easy to use. Um, the, the platforms on various mobile devices are, are, are very slick. They give you really nice reports and and all that, but one of the things we're, that we're starting to find as well as other labs is that these, these accelerometers don't really give you a very good idea of the actual bone forces that someone's experiencing. So in fact, they can be really quite, quite misleading when it, when it comes to that. So 
Yeah, so we, what we try to do is we try to encourage people away from using a sensor because, um, you know, I think that the accuracy of like a sensor that you attach to someone um, and guessing these internal forces is not, not so good. And so we, we really need to be kind of moving away from doing that because there's just the technology is just not quite there yet. And so the gold standard would be musculoskeletal modeling, which is a three-dimensional di three motion capture system. Um, we, we do musculoskeletal modeling. We model uh, tibial bone forces, for instance. Um, it takes us a while to get set up to do a data collection. We use, a, we use an instrumented treadmill or force plates as well as our 3D camera system. And then there's a lot of computational work to do that. So I, so I think that the idea that we can put a single sensor on someone and expect that to replicate these like you know, very complicated um, mathematical problems uh, is is probably a little bit a little bit of a stretch. So, again, when I, when I come back to like like tibial bone forces, it really comes down to the plantar flexor forces. And I think from a clinician's standpoint, I think we all have a pretty good idea of what contributes to or what's what what like what type of activities are going to demand really high plantar flexor forces. So I think like shifting away from relying on some sort of sensor to instead relying on your kind of your your clinical know-how and what kind of what you think is going to put a lot of load on someone's plantar flexors is probably going to be putting a lot of load on their on their tibia or their metatarsals or their navicular or what have you um, and so yeah so we we really we really focus on not using sensors at all I, I really rarely use them for whenever I'm working with any, with any sort of patient uh, I do, might do some video gate analysis um, but for the most part uh, I'm using more of my kind of clinical expertise to figure out how to do uh, progressions with someone. Is there any, and it doesn't have to necessarily be tech, but is there any lower tech or more realistic things that people can use? You know, maybe you lose the accuracy, of course, that you wouldn't get with motion capture and, um, and modeling, but is there simpler ways people can uh, look at maybe kinematics or anything like that where you would say, you know, you lose the accuracy, but it's still got some value? Yeah, well, there are a couple different ways to look at that. I think, so good, a good rule of thumb is the closer you get to the ground with an injury, the more biomechanics matters. So like foot and ankle injuries, biomechanics is super, super important. When it comes to like metatarsal bone stress injuries, uh, I think that's probably the best, the best example of that. So using some sort of like pressure sensing insole where you can look at the distribution of forces on the various metatarsals can tell you a lot. So if you have someone who's got a fifth metatarsal bone stress injury, and they, you put them in these pressure insoles and it looks like they're loading the lateral aspect of their foot, then that makes a lot of sense to develop like a foot orthosis or something like that to shift that center pressure more medially away from their fifth metatarsal. So I think, I think when, you're, when you're looking at like tools that you can use, I think the foot and ankle is probably the easiest um, to do. Uh, you know, the, the flip side of that is the further you get away from the ground, so when you start thinking about like like femoral bone stress injuries, sacral bone stress injuries, it's going to be really quite hard to use any sort of sensor to, to even guesstimate what's causing that, like various biomechanical loads on, on someone. And, and in fact, that makes a lot of sense. It's quite handy too because when we look at more proximal bone stress injuries, so sacrum, femoral neck, femur, these are bones that are very trabecular rich, which is that spongy bone. And that type of bone is very metabolically demanding. And those type of bone stress injuries tend to be much more associated with low energy availability rather than how someone is running or jumping. So if you have someone who's coming in with a sacral bone stress injury or femoral neck bone stress injury, you should always first and foremost be thinking about low energy availability or relative energy deficiency in sport rather than how someone's moving. Again, foot and ankle, start thinking much more about biomechanics. Those, are, those bone sites tend to be much more cortical in nature, so this very dense bone on the outside. Um, and I think that your knowledge of biomechanics can be much more helpful there. Um, the second part of it, too, is that loading intensity matters the most. So when we look at, uh, when we look at repetitive loading, a lot of times, I think like historically we've kind of always thought about bone stress injuries as being due to repetitive loading. Um, but really it's, the, it's those, those really high peak load activities that seem to cause the most damage. So jumping, for instance, cutting, uh, coming around a screen, those are going to be really quite challenging uh, for a bone. And so a good rule of thumb is that for every 1% that you increase a load on a bone, it increases the, the risk or the rate of bone micro damage by a factor of 5 to 10. And so 
when you go up even just a little bit and loading intensity per step, that's going to have an outsized increase in the amount of micro damage that's going to be occurring. So if we can kind of work backward from that, rather than like looking at like, say like total player load or some sort of other metric that a you know, wearable device company might come up with, if you just simply are counting like how many times is a, is a basketball player jumping during a game, how many times are they coming around screens, how close are they getting to the basket? So how like how many times they're getting like in down in that within like a couple feet of the of a um, the backboard? That's usually when player intensity is going to go up the most, or biomechanical loads are going to go up the most. So if you can kind of think about counting those and just count the number of times that they're jumping, um, I think that that's going to give you a much better idea because that one jump is going to mean a lot more to that bone than running I don't know 500 or 1,000 steps, um, which is not going to be as much load on the bone. Do you, in that sort of um, in that context, say with basketball, do you find if you're using running related data as your key metric for overall load, do you think that creates a little bit too much noise in the sort of maybe you overcorrect because maybe the running loads vary more, but they're not as uh, as influential? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think when you, I mean, I think the thing to think about is that well, first of all, basketball players and soccer players have have really good bone quality, and and so. And they have really good bone quality for a really good reason, and that's because the type of loading that they're typically doing during their sport is very osteogenic. It causes bones to adapt in a very rapid manner. Um, there's, of course, a flip side of that, too, and that's that you know, when, we, when they get a bone stress injury, you can typically point back to some sort of biomechanical loading that the person has done you know, to get there. And so for, for, for those type of athletes... It's a, lot, it's a lot easier. It kind of always starts with how much biomechanical load the person is experiencing. And then you should really try to deconstruct that injury and see what kind of, what kind of athlete they are, what kind of, um, what kind of moves that they're typically doing when they're playing. And then those are going to be the most stressful activities for that athlete to get back to. So let's say you have a, you have a guard um, who's driving to the hoop a lot. They get an anterior cortex tibial bone stress injury. I mean, that's going to be the injury that's going to be the hardest to get back to. Running in and of itself is... You know, I think a lot of times people see this as this kind of this this, this marker of success, um, but the load on the bone when you're running is actually is not terribly high, um, and and so I think I think oftentimes rehab staffs put maybe a little bit too much emphasis on getting back to running instead of perhaps getting back to the more stressful activities such as jumping and cutting um, those those type of activities. So I think I think that and it, you know I think when you see this, you'll often see probably maybe too much emphasis on getting an athlete like, like into like, I don't know, an alter G for instance, let's get that person up and running. Let's get them doing this. And, but the, you know, again, the loads, particularly when you're unloading someone in an alter G are not, not very high. You're, you're, you're essentially just exercising the athlete, not necessarily causing some sort of bony adaptation um, for the athlete uh, or bony st or some sort of stimulus to get bony adaptation. So I think like what we need to do is kind of take a step back and look at the type of science that is, um, supporting different types of loading parameters that's going to drive bony adaptation for an athlete who's recovering from an injury so we can try to get them back a little bit earlier. Um, and, you know, one of the big things, too, that we see with bone stress injuries is that there, there's a really high rate of recurrence. We see that out of every three athletes um, who will suffer a bone stress injury, at least one will have a recurrence within the next year. And so that tells you that we're probably not doing a very good job of getting these athletes back to sport um, as far as like preparing them for those player type loads that they need to be ready to be experiencing. I wonder if like if, if when clinicians aren't maybe grounded enough in principles and sort of like a criteria based system, return mm -hmm. to running is just such a catchy phrase, A, but I think it becomes yeah. this kind of landmark moment of like in a lot of different injury contexts, return to running is a big point in time and then the next thing we're thinking about in sort of vague language is return to play or return to train return to play return to perform i think sometimes like the semantics of how we verbalize rehab sometimes distracts from us thinking in sort of foundation sciences of like what's the actual force what supersedes this what, what order are we kind of ranking our rehab uh, interventions and stages in i just wonder if sometimes like the language we use can sort of distract us from what we actually need to do. I don't know what. what yeah, you're I mean, I think so. I think I mean, we're, you know, running is a fundamental movement skill when it comes to athletics. So I think I mean, it's you know, rightfully there's a lot of emphasis placed on it. But there are a lot of other things too that are really important, like jumping and cutting and doing those other activities yeah. as well. And so, um, 
you know, when, when, you, when you look at, so what we've done in our lab is we've, through our, with our musculoskeletal modeling, we've had people come into our lab and we've had them do a series of, of activities, everything from doing a calf raise with like bilateral calf raises without any weight to doing a single leg calf raise without weight. Single leg calf raise is 25% of their body weight. And then keep going up from there and we've been able to create like a bone loading ladder, if you will. And with the musculoskeletal yeah. modeling, what we, what we were able to do is get what's called the, the uh, tibial bending moment. And so if you can kind of imagine your plantar flexors on the posterior side of your, of your tibia, every time that muscle contracts, it's going to bend this, this tibia backward. And, and by, by doing that, it creates kind of compression on the posterior side and tension on the anterior side. And so if you have a pretty good idea of like, again, those plantar flexor forces and then the overall bone structure, you can come up with a pretty good bone loading ladder. And so when we, when we look at across like all these different activities, of course, doing a bilateral calf raise is not very much weight, you know? So you're looking at 50% weight bearing on each limb and you're only looking at maybe like, I don't know, two body weights of load on your, on your tibia. Again, when you look at running, you're talking about seven, eight, nine, maybe 10 body weights of total tibial bone force. Um, and then on the far end of the spectrum is going to be like a pogo type hop where you're, you're really kind of constraining knee motion, constraining hip motion, and you're getting most of your hopping from your plantar flexors and you're getting off that ground very, very quickly. That's going to be a tremendous amount of force on your, on your tibia and also metatarsals. And then particularly when you start hopping, not just vertically, but hopping forward, because now you're you're putting it, you're kicking in like all the contributors or all the, all the aspects of what our plantar flexors do, which is, you know, vertical hopping is going to be one part of it. But when you're hopping forward, that's going to get vertical hopping, but also the propulsive forces. And that's going to give you your greatest bending force. So if you can kind of imagine this, like very much this hierarchy of loading from doing a bilateral calf raise without weight, the whole way to doing forward pogo hopping or perhaps if you're doing like zigzag type hopping that's going to be like the some of the highest loads that you'll ever experience um and then when you think about like forward pogo hopping that looks very much like a layup or driving layup or like a euro type step or something like that and so in order to get your athlete ready to be doing those things you should be doing some sort of pogo type hopping in the last i don't know phase of your rehab as you're starting to get your athlete back now the cool thing about understanding these bone forces is that we need to make sure that we're understanding that the force on a person is a lot different than regional bone forces. And so when we're thinking about like doing, I don't know, like for instance, in, I don't know, in professional sports, for instance, there's a, a lot of emphasis on like counter movement jumping or force plate testing with someone. And we're looking at like the amount, how high someone is jumping. And when you do like a counter movement jump, if you will, a lot of that force is coming from your hip extensors and your quads. You're actually not getting very much contribution from your plantar flexors. And that's actually really great knowledge to have because what that means is that if you have someone who has a tibial bone stress injury, you can get that athlete back doing something like spot shooting or something like that that is essentially like a 50 or 25% counter movement jump. You can get them doing that even before they start running because the loads of running are actually greater than a bilateral counter movement jump. And so that can be really good knowledge to have because it's going to be really good for the athlete to instead of focusing on, hey, let's get back to running really, really quickly, let's instead start thinking about, hey, let's start doing some like really basic basketball skills, like a spot shooting or something like that, uh, or form shooting. It's something you can do really quite, quite early. And the loads that you see with like form shooting, for instance, are not really a lot bigger than just walking. So if your athlete can start walking, you can start doing those kinds of things for them. And they can understand that there's like this longitudinal process there. They don't feel the need to start rushing back to things. Um, and then when you get them running, um, you can start doing so in a very gradual manner because you're going to be spending your time doing a lot of other activities as well as part of your rehab program. I guess as well then when you've got that assembly of a kind of loading hierarchy you can actually periodize your um, even more your, your more kind of dynamic tests more effectively so if, if you know that the counter movement jump doesn't have huge ankle demands well then if you've got an asymmetry when you do the counter movement jump then they're probably not going to be ready to do these more like single leg propulsive based hops and tests you probably want to iron out the deficiencies, the deficiencies that you see in a, in a lesser test in the counter movement jump in that instance. Yeah, precisely. Yeah, I think that's a really good way to think about it. So, yeah, and I think I think too. I, I mean, again, this I kind of always come back to the impact for. And this is a bias I have because my when I was doing my PhD in the early some early studies we were doing with with bone stress injuries, we got really focused on these impact forces. But um, just to kind of put like I don't know some like 
fine points on how important plantar flexor muscle forces are, whatever, the thigh, it's going to be quad and an adductor and uh, hip extensor when you're talking about femur bone forces. But, um, you know, when you're, when you're looking at, let's say like, like a jumping athlete, and let, we'll take some extremes. So let's say, uh, let's say like a hurdler who's always going to be taking off with the same, the same foot. They're, they're leading with the same leg typically. The, of course, your impact forces on your leading leg are going to be the greatest, but your, your jumping leg, the plantar flexor forces are going to be greater, if that makes sense, or so your, your trailing leg. And when we look at those type of unilateral athletes, the, the trailing leg, which is going to be pushing off, has not only does it have a, a larger plantar flexor, but it also has a stronger and larger tibia underneath that plantar flexor as well. So we see, we see better bone density, better bone mass in that, in that jumping leg rather than the landing leg. So when it comes to doing these like, counter movement jumps or what have you, you know, what, what really matters a lot is the takeoff phase when you're jumping, but also when, you, when you're landing, if you're thinking about, hey, how can I really control these bone forces on someone? What you can do is you can, you can cue them to land a little bit differently. And so if you can get them to land, uh, and this is a little bit counterintuitive, again, trying to move away from this, this idea of impact forces, cueing someone to land soft versus landing just a normal landing. A softer landing increases bone forces by about 15 to 20%. And that's because our muscles are going to be attenuating that landing. And so you can kind of work backward from that too if you're thinking about like building up some sort of like a, like a, some sort of progression. Doing a, a jump up onto a box or something along those lines is you're, you're really only getting one cycle of bone loading out of that versus when you're doing like a true counter movement jump, you're getting a loading on the bone when you take off and then a loading on the bone when you land, if that makes sense. Yeah. Just as a, a bit of a tangent, you know, if we're kind of thinking about, I guess, muscle tendon unit efficiency there and how that uh, interacts with it, how much do you dig into sort of a history of maybe Achilles injuries and things like that, Where, how much do you, or how much overlap do you see between um, Achilles injuries and maybe future bone stress injuries? Ah, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, some, yeah, definitely some. I think, I think there's some metabolic issues that affect both tendon as well as bone. And so I, the most obvious one would be like, so like if an athlete is taking a lot of NSAIDs, um, for instance, like NSAIDs upsets that, collagen formation cascade that's going to decrease tendon health and it's also going to decrease bone health as well and so sometimes you'll see some overlap of of, of risk factors um, but uh, you know a lot of times they end up being different athletes and, and and I'm not I'm not always entirely sure why that might be I mean I think I mean they're basketball players or soccer players so they're going to be loading both their bones and their tendons quite a bit so yeah. it is not unusual to see these injuries in the same person but as far as like overall risk factors and why they why they might contribute why they might kind of might see them the same athlete I'm not I'm not sure if anybody's really looked into that um a ton I, w I would say that a lot of times for when we when we look though at like some workload stuff tendon is tendon's pretty unique in that it it's obviously this big energy storage and release structure. So when we're jumping and running, like for instance, our Achilles stores about 35% of the total work of running and then it's going to return that. So it's this big point of efficiency there. And so, uh, so when we're, when we're looking at, at doing any, any type of jumping activity, your, your, your higher jumpers are going to have greater tendon forces, and then your higher jumpers are also going to have higher bone forces as well. So I think from, from that aspect, there is probably going to be um, some overlap as far as from a biomechanical loading um, standpoint. But when you're, when you're looking at two athletes and they are both, they, they're both like the same body mass, um, they both can same, play in the same style, um, and they are both jumping the same height, the athlete who has the smaller bone is going to have the, is going to get that bone stress injury first. So the easiest way to kind of look at this is like is, is ankle width. So malleolar distance or width. If you can kind of look at that, is actually a really good predictor of the like how thick or how wide someone's tibia is. It's also a very good predictor of like like the bone geometry across the whole body is that that malleolar width. So if you're looking at like hey if I who's going to be at greatest risk for developing a bone stress injury? We should be looking at like bone structure. And of course, the easiest way to do that is with like a, like a DEXA, if you will. Um, or if you're getting really exact, you can do like, uh, you can do PQCT, which is going to give you an estimate of bone strength. 
But if you're just looking to do like kind of some, some shotgun measurements, if you're looking at the athlete who has the skinniest ankle is going to be, you know, really the greatest risk for, for developing a, some sort of bone stress injury. And you can also take this down to the foot too. When you look at like, um, like, like metatarsals, like the greatest risk for some sort of metatarsal bone stress injury, someone who has kind of very long and slender feet, um, that person is going to be the greatest risk for developing a bone stress injury because now you've got a, a bone that is very long and it's typically going to, going to be very skinny. And because of that, it's going to be very, very flexy when they're kind of pushing off the ground and, and, and cutting. Um, what I just described is someone can also jump very high as well too. You know, that's some, usually those, those people, they, they tend to be kind of have less mass on their lower leg. And um, so I know I'm kind of being a little bit... Uh, circular in my logic as far as like coming back to your, to your point, but I, I can't, I can kind of see that there would be some overlap, but I, I have to tell you, I don't think anybody's ever actually looked into that. So I, I would say that when you look at the, I, the understanding of bone forces and what are risk factors for bone stress injuries in non-runners and non-military, we, we really don't know that very well. Um, we know that these, these sorts of athletes get much different bone stress injuries than runners, um, much different bone stress injuries and someone who's in the military. There's a lot of similarities between the type of bone stress injuries that like someone who's going through basic combat training might get in your average endurance runner. But if you're taking that same approach and trying to apply those same concepts to a basketball or a soccer player, you're, you're probably going to probably going to miss some things because they end up getting much different bone stress injuries. So like for instance, in the runner, runners far and away, the most common bone stress injury that they'll get will be a metatarsal, a second metatarsal bone stress injury or a tibial bone stress injury. For basketball and soccer, as I think anybody who's listening who has any background in those sports, they know that it's almost always going to be your fifth metatarsal um, for those athletes. So the loads are, loads are quite a bit different. And I, and I do think, you know, going back to your point that I think it's, it, there is a lot of overlap there and like that kind of profile of the athlete is going to get both of those from a, from a, uh, from a structural standpoint. Yeah, obviously, sports like basketball have um, a real challenge in terms of schedule density and schedule mm -hmm. fluctuations. Um, and bone stress injuries are sort of notorious for having a lag time in terms of when the site may become symptomatic. How can, how can kind of clinicians become better at accounting for this or mitigating this challenge? Yeah, that was, so that's really tough um, to do. I think, I think first acknowledging that that lag exists, I think is, can be really helpful. And, and just understanding that you need to be kind of cognizant of that. Um, the NBA season is 82 games long, you know, and if you go into playoffs, which we're just entering into right now, your season's going to be even longer. Um, if you're doing some sort of international play over the summer, now you've got, you've got a pretty long pretty long loading season there and you're not getting, uh, not getting a lot of time off. Um, and what you kind of described is, you know, what we see at the very beginning of and the NBA does a really good job of tracking these sorts of things. You see that bone stress injuries peak in the NBA six weeks after the start of training camp. And that's because like athletes are coming in, maybe they took some time off for the summer, maybe they took too much time off and they're, um, or they didn't, do the type of loading that they should have been doing over the summer to prep themselves for, you know, the, this big jump in overall bone workload when they report to their team. Um, and bone stress injuries tend to peak around week six or so. And so knowing that, you know, you can kind of plan your season out a little bit. And so a really important thing, and I think most teams do this, is the week before uh, players are supposed to report, they program in some sort of deloading week. Um, and then throughout the season, it's really important to program in some time where, the overall workload on the athlete is is going to be a, you know a little bit less, and so we can't sit there and say, "Hey, all right, this player who's you know who's made a career out of jumping high and cutting fast and, and, and running fast," you can't go out there and tell them, "Hey, don't let's not jump as high today." Um, the really, really the easiest way to do that is just cut cut back on the exposure to those type of loads, and and know that by doing that you're allowing that athlete's physiology to catch up with the type of loading that they've been experiencing. And um, the, the bones are going to get a chance to adapt. And, 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 and then you can start building back up again after that. Uh, you, can, you can think a lot about that too during, during your rehab. And again, I'll kind of go back to the idea that bone, the biomechanical loading intensity is the most stressful for, for bone when it comes to accumulating bone micro damage. And a really important thing when you're thinking about from a rehab standpoint is as you're, as you're progressing an athlete 
back to more and more stressful activities. So let's say you're doing things in a very kind of controlled manner in your, in your clinic. Um, you start transitioning them to doing some, I don't know, short court play or something like that, something where you're doing some sort of activities on the court. It's really important to understand that there's some, essentially some, uh, some chaos that's introduced to this athlete's bone loading program. And that is going to be uh, associated with much greater bone forces and, and bone bending moments as well and bone you know, micro damage. And so what you want to do is you want to cut back on your duration of that practice for that day. And so maybe get them out, only do a little bit, pull them out, and then do some activities that are going to, that maybe you did in the early stages of rehab, such as more strength training. And, and, and strength training is, is awesome, but it, it, it frankly, it only gets us so far in the early just always only really pretty much helpful in our very early stages of, of rehab. And so pulling back temporarily for a couple of days on your total volume and then slowly increasing volume and then adding more intensity, pull back on your training volume and doing that can help your athlete um, kind of re return after a bone stress injury a little bit, a little bit better. I'll go and flip back to the athlete during the season. The other thing that's really important too is when you have breaks during the season, it's important for the athlete to make the most of that time when it comes to deloading a little bit to allow their, um, their physiology to catch up with where they are. So like the NBA All-Star break is a great example of that. Um, that's going to be a great time for, for athletes to kind of cool it with the, with, um, like the on-court type activities if they can. Um, and, um, and that's actually the time to do the types of activities that we know if an you know, athlete is wanting to continue to, uh, to do some conditioning type exercises. It, it's the time to do activities that are not what we would typically consider to be very osteogenic. So things like, I don't know, stationary cycling would be a great example. Um, so doing intervals on a bike would be, there's not a lot of bone load there. Um, the athlete can still stay very fit. Um, but because it's not loading the bone a lot, the bone can recover and uh, can then gain some strength. And then when you go back to, you know, full play, you're going to be, you're going to be good to go. Yeah. How do we, how do you, probably more importantly, how do you detect if things are going well versus not so well in the, in the rehab process? Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. Well, uh, two things um, that I, I think are really important to think, think about. Um, first is, is that muscle and bone are very synergistic. And so uh, like a, you know, bone needs a muscle attached to it um, because, well, actually, let, let's go and flip it around. So a muscle needs to have a bone because it's going to give it its leverage. It's also going to give it some sort of foundation so it can exert force. Um, bone requires muscle to uh, exert forces on it, and that's what's going to cause the bone to adapt. There's also a lot of hormonal uh, crosstalk that is, that is occurring there too. So, um, but I think a better way to think about it is that um, muscle is synergistically dominant on bone. And that is, is that as muscle goes, bone will go. And so if you have an athlete who is experiencing a lot of muscle soreness, that's usually a good sign that you're really challenging this athlete with the rate of progression that you're doing. Um, their, their muscular system is having a hard time keeping up with those loads. And we don't get that sort of nice sensory feedback from bone. And so what you can expect is that if their muscles are having a hard time keeping up with the type of loads that you're throwing at them, their bones are also having a hard time keeping up with that. And unfortunately, we don't really know that until we start developing some sort of pathological bone response, such as a stress reaction or, or something along those lines that is going to be, suddenly become very symptomatic. And then because of that, you know, muscle, as we know, rehabs very, very quickly for the most part. Um, if you start getting some muscle soreness, you can always pull back and things are going to be able to recover very quickly. But for a bone, once you start developing some sort of bone pathology, as we all know, it takes a little bit more time to recover from that. So that, I would say that that would be number one. It's paid very close attention to muscular soreness. Um, number two, if you have someone who is recovering from a bone stress injury, you really need to have a, a no pain rule. And that's really, really important. And that differs a lot from rehabbing tendon injuries. For tendon injuries, as we all know, we, most of us use some sort of pain monitoring model where we allow pain maybe in the early stages, maybe up to three uh, out of 10 when it comes to our loading, maybe once we get to know that athlete better, maybe even up to a, like a five out of 10. Um, for, for bone, if you're getting bone site pain when you're loading, that is the bone's way of saying that you're, you're mechanically overloading that bone it is not ready from a structural standpoint to be tolerating those loads. So there's that type of pain. Then there's the pain that you get later on. So if you get pain in the evening or the pain in the next, the next day, what's happened there is that 
you have biomechanically overloaded the bone, and then the bone has had some sort of a tissue response. Typically, the reason why you start developing some pain is because there's been an increase in bone marrow edema or an increase in periosteal edema. And that's going to result in some sort of sensory input. And so the athlete often will think about, well, hey, I got through that workout pretty good. I felt pretty good, but I got sore the next day. It's not that big of a deal. It's actually that pain the next day that you want to care about the most. And both of those matter a lot. And so it's really important when you're working with your athlete to tell them, hey, if, you get, if you're getting bone site or bone or BSI site pain during the loading or the next day, you need to let me know right away so we can make some, make some adaptations to your program. So you, and it, just, it doesn't mean that person refractured. It just means that the rate of progression that you're doing is outpacing that athlete's physiology's ability to adapt to those loads. And you just need to pause things for a little bit and allow that athlete's physiology to catch up with where you are. I'm, I'm going to word this in a really binary way, but it obviously doesn't have to be binary. Um, what are you kind of more wary of if we're talking about this kind of maybe DOMS leaving clues? Um, are you more wary of, say, in the wellness report that they've got a maybe a, you know, a daily pattern of DOMS? Or are you more wary of the mm. short, sharp, acute spike in the DOMS? If you have to pick one, you don't have to pick one. It could be, a, you know, it could be either or both. It doesn't have to be binary. Yeah, I mean, we're all allowed to get some DOMS here and there, right? I think it's the, yeah. the more the daily type of things that you're going to be more more concerned with. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think for me, one of the athlete I would be really concerned about is the athlete who maybe only played a year of college basketball, um, who, who made the jump to the NBA, and now they're you know, going from 30-some games a year to now 82 games plus preseason games and so forth. And they're, they come in, they're really hot to make a roster, uh, and so they're, they're really gunning pretty hard and maybe they are gunning really hard over the summer and they, they come in, um, with a really high, uh, rate of workload leading right up until camp. And then that athlete shows up, they're developing, they're reporting some, some, some daily soreness. Um, that's athlete I'm going to be you know, really worried about because that's going to be a, a really rapid increase in overall workload. And so, and one of the things you see a lot, and, and again, you see this in the military for that same type of person who's like, doesn't want to get uh, kind of what, what they call recycled from, from basic combat training, meaning they get injured and they, they can't finish it. Um, those bone stress injuries that you see in the first couple weeks of, of like a, some sort of team's camp, those are not bone stress injuries that they got during camp. Those are bone stress injuries that they probably were developing before they showed up. And that's a great sign. So if you're seeing that on your team, that means you really need to be thinking about talking to your athletes about, hey, make sure you cool it for the week before you show up. Um, the other thing you might want to start thinking about, too, is putting them on some sort of loading program over the summer that makes a lot of sense from a bone standpoint. And, and um, that looks a lot different than the type of loading that you might do for tendon health or for, for muscle health. Um, and the way we load bone, it needs to be very much tailored to how bone's going to respond versus tendon versus muscle. And those, two, those three things are, are quite a bit different. And I think that when I, whenever I work with, with teams, this is one of the things I spend the most time on is like, how can we tailor our loading to really enhance bone strength the most and make sure that you're doing that differently than you would for like a tendinopathy versus, I don't know, like a hamstring strain or a soleus strain. The, the, you should be really thinking about those different tissues from, a di from using different types of loading strategies. And so... Um, being very, very smart and savvy about that over the summer, but also at the same time, so they're not doing so much loading over the summer that they already have like a subclinical um, like bone stress reaction going on when they first show up to camp is, is, is I, I think it's a pretty hard thing to do. Um, but I, I think the best thing to do is like, if, you've, if you're on a team, if you're on a, like a staff of a team and you've had a history of bone stress injuries on your team in the past, you should start thinking about making some adjustments. And particularly if your roster is not changing very much from year to year. And I, I know that can be very challenging in some, some environments. But um, usually where there's smoke, there's fire. And that can tell you that you need to be thinking about, you know, may, making some adjustments in, in, in how your athletes are preparing for the season. Earlier on, you kind of mentioned, uh, I guess, the contrast in, say, distal versus proximal uh, mm -hmm. bone stress injuries. Um, with regards to kind of energy deficient versus maybe more biomechanical lead. How do we if we're going down this kind of biomechanical lens, how do, we, how do you kind of load and rehab different types of bony tissue um, in these more distal biomechanically led bone stress injuries? Yeah, it, well, let's see here. I, I think the good way to think about it is, let's talk about like extrinsic 
uh, bone stress injuries versus intrinsic bone stress injuries. So I mean by intrinsic, of course, are metatarsal bone stress injuries. Uh, navicular, those are going to be the most common that you're going to see in the sports that we're talking about today. Uh, extrinsic tibia, far and away, is going to be is going to be the most the most common there. So when when I when I think about loading those, um, you know, for the intrinsic muscle or those intrinsic bone stress injuries, the number one contributor to those is going to be again plantar flexor force. And so, like in the early stages of rehab, I'll be doing a lot of loading with the shoe on. Um, so we we'll start doing some weighted calf raises or for, maybe start off doing, of course, non, non-weighted versus body weight calf raises and then start adding some load to them. Um, but essentially, you really want to start rehabbing these almost like they have plantar heel pain, if you will. So you want to really start thinking about how can I get this person's plantar flexors as strong as possible? And then once you get to a certain point, then you want to start taking that person's shoe off. And the moment you start taking the shoe off, I think shoes, I think a great way to think about a shoe is that it's like essentially this, this, um, this exoskeleton on the foot and it shields those, those intrinsic foot musculature from, from loads. And so when, as soon as you take that shoe off, you need to drop down and wait and then continue to, um, doing your calf raises with some sort of load. But of course you're going to need to drop down and load too, because now that foot is not as stable. There's a greater demand on the foot musculature and that's going to put greater load on the, on the metatarsals. Um, and then the other thing too, when you think about like what's the biggest contributor to these intrinsic bones when it comes to forces, um, it really ends up being like again that that high intrinsic muscle force contraction, uh, but also the wind last mechanism as well. So the higher you get up on your toes, if you will, and then again this goes back to this: if you're dealing with some sort of got got you know plantar heel pain or plantar fasciopathy. The more you get up on your toes, the more you're going to engage that, that person's wind last mechanism, the greater the bending and twisting forces are going to be on the metatarsals and the, your, your uh, navicular. And um, that's going to help that athlete get back to playing. Of course, they're not going to be playing without their shoes on. But what you kind of want is you want to have a person who has you know, bone, bones that are stronger than what they need when they go back to playing basketball or, or soccer. And so doing, doing some, some heavy stuff without, without your shoes on matters a lot for those, for those intrinsic uh, bone stress injuries for for extrinsic for tibia. I don't. I mean, I think it's really important to do the opposite. You really need to keep the shoe on, because when you when you're doing loading with the shoe on, that means you can lift more weight. And for me, with most of these injuries, I always think about how can I get more load on this person, and, and like in particular on this person's site of injury. And if we can do more load with the shoe on, that means they can they can plantar flex more. They're going to get more you know, greater plantar flexor forces on their tibia. That means they're going to be bending and twisting that tibia more, and that's going to be a greater bone stimulus um, for them. So, so thinking about those, those types of activities, I think, are, 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 are really important um, from an early loading standpoint. When we start thinking about in the later stages of, of rehab, that push-off type force is what kind of locks that foot out and really compresses and bends those metatarsals quite a bit, and particularly your your um, your navicular is where you're going to get a lot of compressive forces there when you're pushing off. So thinking a lot about spending some time doing those type of activities, uh, or that's going to be your most stressful thing for those for those intrinsic foot injuries. For the tibia, far and away the most stressful thing is going to be doing some sort of jump with a that's coupled with some sort of cutting activity. So like a slashing move to the basket followed by a layup that's going to be the most stressful thing for them to get back to. And so making sure that you're working some of that stuff into your program in the later stages in a very progressive manner and counting how many times they're doing those drives to the hoop. Um, when you're doing this return to court activities, I think is going to be really important to make sure that you can very progressively increase the amount of loads that this person is doing. And obviously kind of if they become symptomatic, that's a, that's a red flag. Um, is there a sort of... Uh, People are always going to ask you, I'm sure, for these numbers of um, what percentage number of reps can you increase by per week or percentage, uh, you know, force. How aggressive can we be in terms of like daily or weekly changes? Well, yeah, a lot of it depends on the side of the bone, the bone stress injury. So when you look at like a bone stress injury that's on a diaphyseal type bone, so like a, a cylindrical bone, like a, like a metatarsal, those you can start loading pretty early and you can you can progress them pretty quickly when you're talking about 
like a like an irregular shaped bone. So navicular is the best example of that. Um, those you have to progress much slower. So I usually progress those about 50% as fast, just because it's they're just not structurally as strong and they, they tend to heal a lot slower. So so I think that I think that's one thing I'm always concerned. About. Let's think about like how how can we control the loads on this bone? And is it is it is the bone going to adapt very quickly? Um, up at the tibia, those the the anterior cortex bone stress injuries are the most difficult, I think, to rehab. And the, there are a lot of those in the in the NBA. Um, and when I do consultations, I would say that that's the type of athlete that I end up being involved with the most from start to finish. Um, they all require surgery. I think that that's an important thing to you know talk about. It's like when to do surgery, when not to do surgery. Um, you know, if you have an athlete who has some sort some sort of cortical disruption of their tibia and the anterior cortex, because that that those plantar flexors are going to bend our, our tibia backward. You can kind of imagine if you've got like some sort of crack there. Every single time that that your plantar flexors contract, it's going to it's going to open that up and it's going to crack that. It's going to not going to allow that diaphyseal crack to actually heal. And so those need to get surgery you know, right away, you really don't want to wait on those. But as you move forward through your rehab, controlling those loads on the anterior tibia are, are, are really very, very difficult. And so um, for those athletes, I, I tend to do it on a player by player basis. I tend to like to be involved with the progression or, or work with the team to try to tell them about these are the things you should be thinking about. These are going to be the most stressful type of loading activities that you're going to be able to get to or that this person's going to be, have trouble with and set up some guidelines for them to, to run an athlete through this whole progression for the athlete. Um, and, and again, the, the simplest are going to be these diaphyseal type bone stress injuries like metatarsals. Those, those heal really um, quite quickly. The more complex ones, which are going to be like tension-sided bone stress injuries like that anterior cortex BSI that I mentioned or an avicular BSI because it's such an irregular shaped bone and there's a lot of different forces that are being experienced there. Blood supply is not so good as well. Um, those more complicated ones I think really need to be done on a, on a player by player basis. And so I, I'd love to say that there's some sort of magic number. Um, but generally speaking, you know, as you're going forward, um, you know, I always think about, well, first off, if, if, you, if the athlete experiences pain, it's, it, it's okay and it's, not, it's really important not to panic. And that's the thing I always, I always tell myself still to this day and I always tell other you know, practitioners that I'm working with, don't panic if it happens. Know that it will. That usually is a great sign that you're going, you're progressing this athlete just as fast as their physiology is going to adapt to it. And, and explaining that to the athlete, hey, you got, you got sore, that means our progression is right on target. It's not a big deal. Let's just take you know, take a step back here. And so usually what I'll do with that athlete who does experience some symptoms with a loading progression is we usually take two to three days um, off from loading to allow things to kind of settle down. Um, we'll do a lot of cross training at times. So again, we'll go back to something that is not very osteogenic from a loading standpoint. So stationary cycling is going to be a really great thing to do. Um, maybe even like someone who's in the early stages, um, maybe get them in the pool, like doing some aquatic therapy for a day or two, just let everything kind of simmer down. And then uh, restart your progression then at that point. And if you have a high risk bone stress injury, a good idea is to actually take a whole step back from where you were. So maybe instead of doing the activities that got them flared up, go back to the activities that you did safely before and make sure you can do those again. And then ease back into what was the thing that got them sore. And then usually once you do that, it's, it's not, that, not that big of a deal. Um, Almost, almost every athlete recovering, particularly from these what we call high risk bone stress injuries, those are usually the ones that require surgery. Almost every one of those athletes is going to have at least one or two episodes where they get sore, and and it's really important for everybody to kind of, I think, maintain a level head and have a strategy going into rehabbing these athletes because it is going to happen. And I would say too, if you're not, if it doesn't happen to you occasionally, that means you're probably underloading your athletes and you're not, you're not probably not progressing them as quickly as you as you might be able to. Um, and, and I think that, uh, I don't know, hopefully, hopefully that gives people some idea like on, on how I'm thinking about them. And, and I would encourage them to think about it um, too. I think our, our, our biggest, I don't know, the best way to kind of think about how we rehab bone stress injuries now, I think I think about this analogy the other day, is like it's, it's, it's very reminiscent of how we rehabbed ACL reconstructions in the 90s and when I was going through PT school where we would have people, they rupture their ACL, they would go through an ACL reconstruction. We would do a lot of straight leg raises with them, a lot of quad sets, maybe some squatting, and then we would then we would gradually put them back out to play. Um, and then we would be so surprised when 50% of them or one out of three would re-rupture or rupture their opposite ACL. Um, that's kind of where we are now with bone stress injuries too. I think that there's this 
this giant period of deloading, which is probably unneeded and unnecessary and actually probably quite detrimental because we see a loss of bone mass in the first six weeks after a bone stress injury. And that's a really great sign that the athlete is, is, is underloading by a considerable degree. And then there's doing some activities and then there's, okay, let's start easing them back into play. And that's, again, it's very, very analogous to how we were treating ACL reconstructions you know, 20, 30 years ago. So we really shouldn't be surprised that one out of three of these bone stress injuries are either experiencing a recurrence of the same bone stress injury, or more likely they're getting a bone stress injury in the opposite leg, because what happens is that not only do you lose bone mass where you have this bone stress injury, but you also lose bone mass in the opposite limb as well. And so knowing that, coming into rehabbing a bone stress injury, what I always have people do is like, okay, that's great. We're going to do some controlled loading on the, on the limb that has the bone stress injury. But for the other limb, one of the best things you can do is like get in the doorway so you can balance on a squat rack and do some pogo hopping, both vertically and then side to side. And of course, the, the whole reason for a doorway is so you can balance yourself so you don't actually, you know, actually throw down your other leg. And just doing some really osteogenic type of loading from day one will hopefully prevent that athlete from getting another bone stress injury in the opposite leg, but also, as you mentioned earlier, like some sort of tendinopathy or something like that when they're also going back to play. Yeah. Because, you know, we're deloading the whole, the whole structure. We're, whole, we're doing a lot of stress shielding there. We've obviously covered quite a lot in this conversation. Is there any, anything that we haven't covered that maybe comes up a lot when you talk to different team practitioners? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I think that we, you know, we hit on them a couple of times, which is like, what, what kind of sensors can, can we use? And I'll, again, I would recommend not, not worrying about using some sort of sensor. Instead, just understand like what increases plantar flexor loads. I think that that's going to be a, a really, uh, really important thing. Um, and, you know, I think the other thing we didn't really talk about that I, it is quite important is that bone responds really well to loading, um, high magnitude loads, um, but its sensitivity or the amount that it's going to respond to those loads declines very, very quickly during an exercise session. And so when you have an athlete uh, who's recovering from a bone stress injury, the way to kind of think about this is, first off, you want to do your most osteogenic activities at the very beginning of the session. And so instead of like easing into those things, you really need to be thinking about doing like your key bone loading exercises at the very beginning of the session. So um, I'll just think about like plyometrics, which are going to be the best thing for a bone. You want to do that at the very beginning of the session when the bone is fresh and when the muscle is, um, is able to generate the most amount of force to it. Second thing is because we start to lose bone sensitivity after you know, 50, 60, 70 uh, loading cycles, um, you really want to keep your loading cycles or loading sessions very brief. And so uh, it, it's much better to, do, to take uh, a bone loading program and split it up and do it three times per day than to do one big bone loading session once per day. Because what you're doing towards the end of that loading session is not going to be very helpful for the athlete. It's not going to be very helpful for the bone. It's just going to be accumulating more micro damage. You're not going to be generating this very adaptive bone response that you want to be getting. So, so I think that brief loading sessions scatter throughout the day. And, and the best way to kind of think about that would be like you wake up, you do some jumps, um, right away, you're, then your athlete maybe um, comes in to the, for rehab, they do some, uh, some prescribed loading with you, and then maybe you go and do some less osteogenic activities, such as, like I was saying, like form shooting or something like that, where you can, okay, we're, it's not like we're gonna just have them come in and jump 40 times while you watch them. You're still gonna go do some other activities with them. So um, do that, maybe do some conditioning stuff, but know that that stuff that you're doing is not doing anything to enhance that athlete's um, healing for their bone stress energy, just helping them build overall conditioning. And then in the evening, the thing to do is do another loading session toward the end of the, towards the end of the day. So another, I don't know, like three sets of 10 or three sets of 20 um, pogo hops, for instance, would be, would be the way to go. So there's that with, from a rehab standpoint. Then during the off season, the way to kind of think about it is to still use that same principle. It's not like the athlete from a bone health standpoint. So let's say you have an athlete who's had a, that you think is at risk for a bone stress injury or has had a bone stress injury in the past. One of the best things you can have that athlete do during the off season is, it's, of course, it's really important to get in the weight room and, and do those kinds of activities and some other conditioning things. But one of the best things you can do is just do some very brief bone loading activities, some hopping type things that they can do over the summer. Um, and you don't want to do a high volume because remember, the higher volume you go with this, the more bone micro damage you're going to start to accumulate. So just doing like 
three sets of 20 single leg pogo hops where you're doing some zigzag hopping where you're really emphasizing getting off the ground very quickly is going to be something that's going to condition the bone, maintain bone mass of the summer. At the same time, you're not overly fatiguing the bone so that then when the athlete shows up for camp, they've got optimal uh, skeletal health and they're, and they're ready for a long season. Better to sear than slow cook across the board yes. for these types of <laughs> Yeah, <injuries>. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. And um, what what have people what, what have you got coming up at the moment? I know you're you're obviously academically involved. Um, mm-hmm. I know you teach a lot as well. What what's going on in your kind of world at the moment that um, we can draw some attention to? Yeah, well, let's see. You know, we're 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 doing we're doing a lot of stuff trying to figure out how we can optimally load. Um, Athletes have a bone stress injury in the early stages after uh, after they have the injury, so we're, we're spending a lot of time and energy uh, on that, both from a research standpoint, but also from a clinical side as well. Um, I think other than that, um, you know, so I really, I mean, I teach in our program research wise. Like I said I do some stuff for the for the DoD, but um, we've got a we've got a course that we have out now where it's an online course where we, we spend a lot of time talking about these bone loading principles and and um, all these various different bone sites and, and and how we can rehab those those a little bit better. Um, if you want to kind of learn more about about what I'm doing um, and, and how to reach me, our, our Instagram page is a great place to go, which is Montana Running Lab. Um, you can also reach out to me via email at, at info at Montana Running Lab dot com. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I think those are kind of the main things. I think like um, I still do a lot of stuff with with runners, of course, and uh, I think that that's still kind of my my original love, I would say. But um, I, I think that um, the the work I've been doing lately, particularly in basketball, has probably been some of the most I don't know some of the best professional growth I've had in my career because it's just such a different environment and the loads that these athletes are experiencing are so different than what runners are experiencing that I, I think that that's something that I'm, I'm spending more and more uh, time and energy and, and working with teams um, with that has been, has been a, a real highlight for my last several years. Cool. Well, thank you very much. I've learned a ton and this is definitely going to be an episode that I play back a few times to myself alone um, just to try and absorb as much of it as I can. I, I imagine a lot of the listeners will do the same. So, Rich, thank you very much for your time today. Thanks, Andy. It's been awesome.